recognize the presence of uh, Mr. Mark Anthony Dasela, one of our professors in the Senior High School Department of, of San Carlos, and some esteemed guests. All right, uh, welcome again to our second academic symposium. And this is the very first online academic symposium ever held in the department. No, uh, in, uh, traditionally, we usually held this uh, symposium or the symposia in our auditorium. And because of the situation where we are in right now, we cannot hold it uh, yet. No, uh, Hopefully in the coming months or in the next year, we can now um, join our speaker in, in uh, sharing wisdom and uh, do this courses no, uh, monthly. So this month's theme is entitled Of Sheep, Goats, and Eschatological Fatalism. Since this topic is quite interesting to us, seminarians, as, fo as it focuses on the discourse on philosophical theology, we should be attentive to what our esteemed speaker for today will give us. As I have heard, our speaker is one of the well-known philosophers in our country. Bigaten, bigaten daw if you like. So without further ado, may I now call on Mr. Jose Luis Fabio of the class of St. Teresa of Calcutta to introduce our speaker. Good morning, everyone. Allow me to introduce our speaker for this morning. He finished his Bachelor of Philosophical Studies in Colegio de San Juan de Leletran and his MA Philosophy Studies in the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He is a research fellow of, fellow of the Southeast Asian Research Center and Hub, and a research affiliate of the Center for Language Technologies and a visiting researcher of several institutions. He is an academic author and a contributor to a number of published journals and book, books. He holds a PhD in philosophy from the De La Salle University, Manila, and is currently one of its associate professors. He is also currently the president of the Philosophical Association of the Philippines. Brothers, let us all welcome Dr. Jeremiah Joven Joaquin. Virtual clap. Supposedly. Hello, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for organizing this, Joshua and the rest of the gang. May I just share my screen, please? Yeah, please allow me to share my screen. Yeah, so it's wonderful to be here. Uh, some of my friends are here, like Dr. Mark Anthony Dasella, and some of my students as well from De La Salle University are also here. Now, what I want to do, so here's my presentation. Now, what I want to do today is just to introduce you to some of the exciting stuff going on in philosophical theology. So my work basically is on logic and metaphysics. So. I'm doing work on formal logic, a lot of stuff in the formal machinery of logic, and a lot of metaphysics as well. So my interests in metaphysics uh, are broad, so I'm interested in modality, I'm interested in personal identity, and so on. Now, but recently, I was enamored by issues in philosophical theology, specifically this brewing discipline, which is known as analytic theology. Now, analytic theology is just about 10 years old, okay? So it's an upcoming, up and coming uh, discussion of theological matters using the lens of analytic philosophy. So the pioneers of this kind of philosophy are uh, Oliver Crisp and Michael Ray. So Oliver Crisp is from, I think, St. Andrews. Michael Ray is from Notre Dame University in the US. Now, the general idea of analytic theology is to apply the tools of analytic philosophy to understand certain theological, mostly Christian doctrines, via, via, via natural reason alone. 
So what are the tools of analytic philosophy? So these are the tools of logical and conceptual analysis. Now, perhaps one way of thinking about what's going on in analytic theology right now is that it's like medieval philosophy. So medieval philosophers like Aquinas, Anselm, and so on, are using the tools of philosophy to understand theological doctrines. That's why they are doctors of the church. Uh, so what's happening now is that there's an advancement in the tools of analytic philosophy. So what these theologians are trying to do is to understand those doctrines in terms of the new tools, conceptual tools offered by analytic philosophy. Now, so what Christian doctrines are being analyzed using this tool? Well, some works have been devoted on the doctrine of Christianity, others on the doctrine of Christology, others on atonement, or soteriology and eschatology. Now, I'll focus on eschatology and a bit on atonement or salvation history, the doctrine of salvation here in this talk. Now, this one is an offshoot of recent work that I've published elsewhere. So I have this paper on hell, heaven, neither or both. So it's a, it's a paper on eschatology. So what happens in the afterlife? Uh, there's also a more popish paper I co-written with Dr. Hazel Viana from De La Salle University. We're looking at the good place and we're trying to understand if you know the Netflix uh, series, the good place. We're trying to understand uh, the philosophical underpinnings of that series. All right, so the outline of the talk will be as follows. So I'm, I'm told that tomorrow is uh, what's that? Christ dying ba tomorrow? Aniba? Christ dying? Right. So the gospel apparently, supposedly tomorrow is the gospel of sheep and goats. I'm not sure if Joshua knows this. That's why he scheduled the talk today. But that's uh, providence, so to speak. So we'll talk about uh, the positive parable of sheep and goats. So I'll focus on that. Then I'll give you the puzzle, a philosophical puzzle that I think will be something interesting for you. I'll also motivate the puzzle and tell you why you should care about this particular eschatological puzzle. I'll outline some possible responses and I'll conclude by summarizing the whole thing. That's the outline of the talk. So let's start with the puzzling parable of sheep and goats. All right, so you know this story. So your seminarians or most of our audience will be Christians or Catholics, right? So this parable is found in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. You know the story, so let's go to the story. Uh, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd, a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Now, if you go through the gospel, right, what will happen to the sheep? So the sheep will go to heaven. What will happen to the goat? So I'll quote this one. He will say to those on, the, on his left, so the goat, depart from me, you are cursed in the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, so I'll stop there. I'll stop there because now that's a question in the doctrine of salvation. Okay? Who will be saved? Who are the sheep? Who are the goats? So that's a, an interesting philosophical issue in this particular doctrine. Now, in your uh, another way of thinking about this is in terms of eschatology, what will happen in the end of days, when God will be back okay, to redeem us, and he will uh, separate the sheep from the goats. Now, what do biblical exegetes say about this? Typo yan, ha? Exegetes. So the parable implies the thought that salvation is attained by, here are some options, so sola fide or sola gratia or sola caritas or fides caritate formata. 
So for Catholics like us, uh, this is our option. Right? It's uh, fides, good works through faith. Right? For non-Catholics, I think Protestants, Lutherans, and Mormons, I think, they, they'll go for sola fide, so by faith alone or by the grace of God. I'm not sure if this is an option by good works, sola caritas. Right? So th those are the options. And, but I'm not concerned with these things. Okay? I'll get another moral. I'll draw a different moral from the parable. I'll say that given the analogy of sheep and goats, the parable seems to imply a puzzle premised on eschatological fatalism. So what's the idea of eschatological fatalism? So the idea is that you are fated to be in heaven or hell. Okay, so the parable of sheep and goat seems to imply that right now you are already a sheep or a goat and you are you will either be in heaven or in hell i'm not sure if you're you're aware of this uh uh implication of the parable but it's, it's an interesting way of, to think about uh this particular uh parable so i'll try to motivate the puzzle the puzzle looks like this so I, I've set it up as an argument so that it's easy to follow. So the first premise is that you are either essentially a sheep or essentially a goat, but not both. Now this one is the crucial uh, caveat in the premise. So it tells you that you're either one exclusively, but you can't be both. Now premise two tells you that if you are essentially a sheep, then you are bound to be with God in heaven. Premise 3 tells you that if you are essentially a goat, then you are bound to be damned in hell. And finally, the conclusion will be you are either bound to be with God in heaven or be damned in hell, but not both. All right. Again, this one will be the crucial uh, caveat in the conclusion, but at least you'll see how the argument flows. That's why I'm calling it eschatological fatalism because right now you're fated to be either one but not both. I'll try to motivate the puzzle as follows. So let's try to think about premise one. You are essentially a sheep or essentially a goat but not both. Now here's a, a way of understanding that. So in the, in the parable, the analogy is sheep and goat. But if you think about it, no sheep can be a goat, right? and no goat can be a sheep. So if you're a sheep, you can't be a goat. If you're a goat, you can't be a sheep. So if God, in the end of days, and he'll redeem us all if he comes back, when he comes back, if you're a Catholic, when he comes back, he'll separate the sheep from the goats. And if you're either one, then there's a definite place for you. And that's, uh, uh, here's a picture. So you're either this guy or you're that guy. Let's try to motivate uh, premises two and three. So if you are essentially a sheep, then you are bound to be with God in heaven. That's premise two. Premise three will tell you if you are essentially a goat, then you are bound to be damned in hell. Well, the, the motivation will be biblical. Okay? So as the passage goes, he will place the sheep on his right, the goats on his left, and those on the right will be with God in heaven, and those on the left, left will be damned in hell. Okay. So I think uh, those two premises follow if you just take in the parable uh, prima facie. So it's like, if you're a sheep, well and good, <laughs> you'll be in heaven. If you're a goat, uh, well and good, you'll be in hell. See you guys there. <clears throat> so let's try to motivate the conclusion. So we have motivated the premises. So premise one, you're either a sheep or a goat, but not both. You're essentially one or the other. Premise two and three, uh, you have a definite place that you'll go, either heaven or hell. Let's not talk about purgatory first. I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that later. 
Okay. Um, then, the conclusion will be, therefore, you're either bound to be with God in heaven or be damned in hell, but not both. So what's the motivation? Well, it, it just follows via logic. So the argument is valid. If I can show that the, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. So I'll just show it. So the argument structure looks like this. If you know your logic, if you have gone through elementary logic, you know that the structure looks like a constructive dilemma argument. So either sheep, you're a sheep or a goat. So we're treating this as a mutually exclusive premise. So we're not using the inclusive or. Uh, two, just is the fatalist premise that if you're a sheep, then you, you'll go to heaven. Uh, premise three, again, is the fatalist premise. If you're a goat, then you'll go to hell. The, the conclusion will be, again, a mutually exclusive conclusion that either you're, you'll be in heaven or you'll be in hell. So uh, just a bit of uh, formalization. So this might look Greek to you. It's not. It's symbolic logic. So I'm just using this um, symbol to just demonstrate the exclusive or. So it's not your usual V symbol for the either or, inclusive or. So that's, that's a more stronger relationship. So it's either P or Q, but not both. Okay, this one is just your conditional, if P, then R. Same with premise three. And your conclusion will be like that. All right? All right, so that's the structure. It's a valid argument in logic. Now, there's a simpler way of thinking about this uh, argument. Okay? Uh, let's call it a simple dilemma argument. So the first premise will be either your sheep or a goat exclusive. Uh, again, the, the two premises here will tell you if, if you're a sheep, then it's fated. Okay? You're fated to be in heaven or whatever. Uh, the third premise, if you're a goat, then you're fated to be in hell. So ergo, it's fate. Okay? So that's the argument in simpler formulation. All right, so the formalization looks like this if you, if you like your logic stuff. Oh, right, so this argument is valid. Okay? So if the premises are true, if you grant that the premises are true, then the conclusion of the argument must be true necessarily follows that if right, the first three premises are true, then you are either bound to be with God in heaven or be damned in hell, but not both. Okay. Now, that's the puzzle. I hope you're motivated. I hope you're thinking about this. I hope you're bothered. I'm not sure if you're bothered because you're sheep naman, you're going to heaven anyway, so you don't care. But I'm bothered because I don't want my, my salvation to be fatalist. I don't, I don't want to be just a sheep or a goat and I can't do anything about it. All right? So why should you care about the puzzle? So that's the question. Well, I'll try to rephrase the question. Perhaps most of you are not, or some of the audience here might not be Christians, right? Uh, sorry, we're, are not Catholics, so they might just be Christian. So why should a Christian care about this puzzle? Or perhaps some of you are not uh, Christians, but you're a theist of some breed. So why should a theist care about a puzzle, oh, about this puzzle? Well, I'll say one important reason to care about this puzzle is that the puzzle raises an issue regarding the nature of God. Let's call it a Christian God or whatnot. But if you believe that this God is an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent being, then the puzzle will raise uh, certain issues concerning this. So let's just define omnipotence in terms of being all powerful, omniscience as being all knowing, and omnibenevolence as being all loving. Now, I'm arguing that if we take the puzzle seriously, then you have to question these uh, properties of God, the omni properties or omni attributes of God. So why is it a puzzle for omnipotence? Again, omnipotence is just the idea that God is all powerful. It's a problem because if the puzzle is right, then God can change the fact that either you will be in hell, exclusive or in heaven. He can't change that. Because if essentially you're a sheep, 
and or essentially you're a goat, you're bound to be in heaven or in hell. But not both. Now, he can't change that because to change that would be to change the fact that you are essentially a sheep or essentially a goat. So if that's the case, he can't, if he can't change that, there's at least one thing that he can't change, thus questioning omnipotence. Why is it a puzzle for, uh, why is it a problem for omniscience? Again, if the puzzle is right, then since God already knows, being omniscient, all-knowing, that you will be in heaven or hell, it follows that if you could change that fact, okay, that you'll be in heaven or in hell, then God does not know everything. Sorry. Does not know everything. So there's a, a thing missing there. So God does not know everything. Because again, if you could change your fate, that is, if you could be a sheep, if you're a goat or a goat, if you're a sheep, then God won't know that you will be bound in heaven or in hell, thus questioning omniscience. Now, finally, why is this a problem for omnibenevolence? Well, if, God, if the puzzle is right, then if God permits some people, perhaps you, but if yes, we'll see each other there, perhaps you to be in hell, then God does not really love everyone. We shall all love him because he'll permit some people to be in hell. Why would he permit that if he is loving? Perhaps he does not really care or it does not really or she, whatever God is. So this questions on the benevolence. So again, if the puzzle is right, uh, you have to let go of either omnipotence, om omniscience, or of the benevolence. But if you let go of either of those, then what's your idea of God? Okay. Now, I'll outline some of the possible responses okay, to the puzzle. And this one will take us to heavy duty philosophy. Okay. So, ko ng konti. Kasi ano to? Baha mawindang kayo sa responses. Okay. So here's the challenge. Here's the puzzle. Okay. So again, it's a eschatological fatalist argument. You are essentially a sheep or essentially a goat, but not both. If you are essentially a sheep, then you'll be with God. If you're a goat, sorry. So either, so on. Right, so I have list, listed down uh, four possible responses that a theist might take. So first will be to reject the whole puzzle. Okay? Eh, ng theist. Another one is to accept that the argument is valid and sound, thus accepting the conclusion. So you're a fatalist about your salvation. Or accept that the argument leading to the puzzle is valid but show that at least one of the premises is false since the argument is unsound so you could have reasons to reject the conclusion or did they deny that the argument is valid okay so i hope uh, these responses are uh, do you understand these responses again the first one uh, it's not really a puzzle i don't care uh, the second one will be uh, it's valid, so accept the conclusion because it's also sound. Uh, the third one, uh, there's a faulty premise, so I have reasons to reject the conclusion. And finally, uh, that the argument is invalid or deny that the argument is valid. Again, you have reasons to reject the conclusion. All right, so let's let's try to think about response one. So if you say that uh, you reject the whole puzzle. Perhaps your reason is, well, God only knows who goes where. So it is not, it is just a matter of faith. You should not question God. That's the Bible. It's also temptation. Thou shalt not question God. So perhaps that's your, your motivation here. That's your response to the puzzle. Well, here's an objection to that response. So if you're going for that kind of thinking, okay, well and good. 
So, but I think we need to have a reasonable, not just blind faith, so to speak. Diba? Yun nga yung motto nila, answer, may fides quadens intelligum. So, we need faith seeking understanding. Diba? We need to uh, think about this. Okay. Wait, can you still hear me? Yes, Dr. Rocky. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. How long did you're not moving anymore. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, going back. So that's response one. I don't think it works. So if you're, if you're um, a theist, a believer in God, we need to have a reasonable faith. So here's another response. I accept that the argument is valid and sound. Now the the problem with this response is since the argument leading to the puzzle is theologically and philosophically motivated, we just need to accept the conclusion. So it's a fatalist uh, take on our salvation. Now, the problem with response two of just accepting your faith uh, is that, well, if we do that, then God might not have those omni properties in the first place. So if you accept the puzzle, if you accept the conclusion of the puzzle, then you might as well reject some of the omni properties of God. So if we believe in God, then we must not go for this option. Right? I don't think that this is a, a good response if you are a theist or a believer in God. So if we have reasonable faith in God, then we must either show that the argument is a false premise, hence it's unsound, or show that the argument is invalid. So the argument leading to the puzzle is invalid, so we have reasons to reject the conclusion. So let's go there. Let's, let's, let's try to think about uh, some responses using these, four, uh, these two possibilities of rejecting one of the premise or denying the validity of the argument. So let's try uh, the first possible response. So um, let, let's show that the argument is unsound. So how do we do that? We reject premise one. Okay, itong premise na to, you are either essentially a sheep or essentially a goat, but not both. You just reject that. So what's the motivation? Well, you can deny essentialism. So you're not really es essentially a sheep or essentially a goat. You could turn into an existentialist about premise one. Hi. Here's a way of motivating that response. You can think about life as a project. So here's a quotable quote from Jean-Paul Sorer. I says, being a man or human being, so major gender insensitive. So for those who are, I know, we must be gender sensitive. So human beings are nothing else but what we make of ourselves. Right, so that's a, a way of thinking about uh, life as a project idea. Or here's another existentialist, uh, Simone de Verbois. She'll say, oh, life is a becoming. So one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. So it's not, you're not essentially a man or essentially a woman. You're, you become those things. So it's an open uh, field for you. I think here's the, uh, well, quotable quote, the quotable quote from uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Young Existence Precedes Essence. So what do we mean by that? We mean that man, first of all, exists, encounters himself, surges up in the world, and defines himself afterwards. So you don't have an essential nature. You're not essentially a sheep or a goat. Uh, you, you become. Uh, he paraphrasing the verb, you might say, uh, one is not born, but rather becomes a sheep or a goat. So if you go back to the biblical exegetes of how they think about that parable, they'll say perhaps it's a kind of sola caritas or fides, uh, yeah, fides uh, caritas 
uh, thing. So you, you do good works in order to have or become a sheep or become a goat. So if that's the case, if we accept that kind of motivation, uh, you have dissolved the puzzle in a way. Because you're accepting that the argument is valid, yes, but premise one is false. Premises two and three are trivially true since essentialism is false. Again, premise two and premise three, if you deny essential, the essential essentiality of being a sheep or being a goat, then this antecedent part will be false, making the second premise true. Uh, you also deny that this one is true, so it's false, so making this uh, premise um, also true, trivially true. Okay, so the argument is still valid, but it's unsound because we, we have reasons to reject premise one. Okay, now here's a problem for response three. Now I've used uh, Sartre and De Verbois, uh, the existentialists. But their version of existentialism is atheistic. <laughs> so hence, uh, we can't use it to solve our theistic puzzle, unless you accept the, the atheist existentialist uh, theory, so to speak. Right? So you can't go for this option if you are a theist. Here's a rejoinder. Oh, yeah. Wait, we can go to a more theistic existentialist, like C. Sartin, Sartin Kierkegaard. Uh, so he tells us that our very existence is a paradox, and each of, our, each of us singularly yearns to be with God. So I think that's an option right, for, for those going for an uh, existentialist solution to the puzzle. However, Again, I, I, there's a problem with theistic existentialism. Why? Because the parable implies a strong essentialist reading. Okay? So being a sheep and, or being a goat must be taken as essential categories and not as uh, some category that you could just dispense away with. So that, that's the idea of this uh, objection. So even if you're a theistic existentialist, you can't do away with the strong essentialist reading of the parable. Okay, so, so existentialism might not be a good response. Right? So let's turn to another response. I'm calling it uh, the Wiggins response. Right? So I'm not sure if you're familiar. So there's this uh, philosopher, David Wiggins, um, in the 1980s, he developed a distinction between what he calls a face and a substance sort of, right? So we could use that distinction to deny premise one, right? So how do we do this? Well, for Wiggins, right, his book, Sameness and Substance Renewed, this is the second edition of his original work. So he distinguishes between sortal concepts, which are substance, con substance sortals, okay? So how does he define substance sortals? Well, concepts that present tensedly apply to an individual X at every moment throughout X's existence, for example, being human, and those do, that, do, uh, that do not, example of being a boy or being a cabinet minister. All right, so the former here will be substance concepts. Ito yung mga concepts that we apply to an individual at every moment of its existence. So for example, you are a human being, that's your substance sort of. You're sorted as a human being. But you are only temporarily a boy or a student, so those categories or those concepts are only face sortals. Okay. So here's a, the motivation that uh, David Wiggins, so that's him, uh, presented for that distinction. So Sabina, you may refuse to say uh, Sir John Doe is the same boy as John Doe, since it is false that Sir John Doe is now a boy. But it is true and perfectly unproblematic that Sir John Doe was the same boy as John Doe was. 
Why? Because again, John Doe is that thing that we track throughout its existence. So this is a kind of personal identity. You're the same thing you are throughout your life because you are the same human being. But of course, uh, you're not the same boy you were yesterday or the same thing you will be tomorrow because those are phase circles. You could be categorized in terms of different phase circles as well. So what's the punchline here? Substance concepts tell us uh, what something ultimately is, so the very nature of that thing, while phase circles only tell us what that thing temporarily is. So in medieval terms, I think you could use, you know, these are essential categories as opposed to temporary or accidental categories. Right? Essential properties or accidental properties, if you want to think in terms of essence, accidents, distinction. So the implication would be something like, uh, regarding the puzzle, we are substantially human beings. We are only temporarily, but not substantially sheep or goats. Okay, so hindi ka talaga sheep or hindi ka talaga goat, but you're a human being. You might become a sheep or you might become a goat later, depending on what you do. All right. So if that's the case, again, uh, the same, the, the same thing happens to the puzzle. So you have reasons to reject premise one. That makes premises two and three trivially true. Because uh, we are not essentially, it's not our substance to be sheep or goat. or just human beings and we will become sheep or we will become goats in the future. So the argument is still valid, but it's still unsound. Because again, the premise one is false. Now, here again, we could have a problem, we could raise the problem that the parable's exegesis implies a strong essentialist reading. It seems like uh, if you take the parable at face value, prima facie, uh, you'll get the conclusion that, wait, you're still a sheep or you're still a goat. So you're either bound to be in heaven or in hell. Okay? So in this case, so sheep and goat are not just face sortos in Wiggins's terms, but as substance sortos. Okay. All right, so far so good. So we have encountered many responses now. Let's go to response five. So here's another response that you'll do. So you're still targeting premise one. Now you could ask the question, Tega lang. It seems like there's a problem with the or. Right? That disjunction will question that. One way of motivating the idea of uh, questioning the or will be, or the sore in this case, exclusive or, will be because the future is still an open one. Right? right now, we're still not sure whether we will become sheep or goats. But it does not discount that you are essentially a sheep or essentially a goat. You will become those things. But because you will become those things because uh, you have done the good things or bad things or whatnot. Here's another way of uh, thinking about this using uh, Buddhist uh, philosophy. The future is completely open and we are writing it moment to moment. Looks like it's essentialist, looks like Wiggins is reply, but it's really not because it's targeting the or, okay, where we will be heading, not our nature. Now, there's an analog okay, uh, in, in Aristotle. So Aristotle has this weird um, argument. He calls it the sea battle argument. It's in his on interpretation or the interpretation if you're now using the Latin. So here's the argument to show that, well, we could have an open future thinking about uh, whatever. So here is Aristotle's argument. Okay. Either there will be a sea battle tomorrow or there will not be. If there will be a sea battle tomorrow, then it is inevitable that there will be if there will not be a sea battle tomorrow, then it's inevitable that there will not be. So therefore, since there's nothing special about sea battles, the future is inevitable. 
So again, this is your fatalist argument. Okay, so Aristotle shows you a kind of uh, fatalist argument using the analog of sea battles tomorrow. Okay? So if you look at it vis-a-vis -vis the puzzle, okay, you, you'll notice that there's something similar going on in these two arguments. Okay? What's the similarity? Well, they share the same structure. Okay? Pareho sila ng structure. So you could say that if the first one is valid, the other one is valid as well. Now, a response to, that Aristotle makes, actually attributed to Aristotle, but I'm not sure whether Aristotle holds that view. A response is that sentences about the future are only contingently true. Okay? They are at present neither true nor false. So what's the motivation? So, so the, the motivation is that when you talk about future contingent things, what will happen in the future, whether you'll go to heaven or hell, uh, it's in the gap between it's true that you'll be in heaven or it's true that you'll be in hell. And that's a gap shot. So between the truths and falsities, you have the gap. Speaking of gaps, so here's a logic detour. This is heavy duty philosophy, so I'm introducing you to stuff in metaphysics, in logic. All right, so here's this guy, Polish logician Jan Lohesevich. And he thinks of Aristotle's uh, sea battle argument as promoting a kind of three valued logic. Now, right now it's called as L3 or Lukasiewicz's uh, three valid logic. So aside from your true and false truth values, you also have a gap, okay? A middle value between true and false. Now, if you want to think about it in terms of logic, so if true is one and false is zero, and there's something in between uh, true and one and zero, so call it a half, okay? Now, the offshoot of this kind of logic is that it denies the law of excluded middle. So if you're familiar with the principles of logic, so you have your principle of identity, if P, then P, or P if and only if P. Uh, you have non-contradiction. It's not the case that P and not P. Now there's an exclusive middle uh, principle or the law of excluded middle, either P or not P. But if you have a gap between truths and falsities, then you need to deny the law of excluded middle. That is, in L3, if at least one premise of an argument is in the gap, then the argument is trivially valid but unsound. Right? That's the implication. If we deny the law of excluded middle, then the puzzle will dissolve. How? Well, first, let's look at Aristotle's argument. Since future contingents are in the gap, it's neither true nor false that there will be a sea battle tomorrow. So premise one will be false. Or at least it's neither true nor false. So it's not true that there will be a sea battle tomorrow or there will not be a sea battle tomorrow. Now, it follows, again, that the argument is trivially valid. Again, uh, basing just from the structure, you'll grant that the argument is valid. If the premises are true, the conclusion must be true, but it's unsound because the first premise is neither true nor false. It's not true. Right. Again, this one is uh, an instance of the excluded middle, either P or P is the case or not P is the case. Okay, so that's excluded middle. So if you go for Dukasevich's uh, logic, uh, you could deny this premise. Now, as a consequence, we could deny uh, the first premise of the puzzle. Since this one is also okay, relying on the law of excluded middle, since there's a gap between truths and falsities, then there are, there's a reason to deny that you are either essentially a sheep or essentially a goat. But not goat. Okay? So this argument will be trivially true, or sorry, trivially valid, but it's unsound because, again, the first premise is not true. Now, 
Ito yung problem. So, when Aristotle's key battle is phrased in the future tense, our eschatological puzzle is not. That's the disanalogy between the two cases. Okay? How do we do this? If we look at the arguments side by side again, this is the one another, you'll notice that the phrasing of our puzzle is in the present tense. While the second, uh, the Aristotle argument is in the future tense. Okay? In this way, there's a disanalogy between the two. So here, uh, our puzzle is really a fatalist puzzle. Because right now, you are essentially a goat or essentially a sheep. Right now, you will be in uh, You are bound to be in heaven or bound to be in hell. So it's not a future thing. It's right. Uh, it's happening now. That you'll be in heaven or you'll be in hell. Okay, so we could grant that while the L3 analysis works for Aristotle's sea battle argument, it does not necessarily work for our puzzle. So we're still left with thinking about, okay, so I'm still fated to be in heaven or in hell. Okay. All right, so here's another response. On dami natin pinag and so uh, we had a logic detour, we have a metaphysics detour, now we'll have another metaphysics detour. Okay. Now, even if we grant that L3 works, that logic works, uh, sorry, di pala to. Another response for uh, five is to deny essentiality. Okay. We're not denying this one, and ito yung i-deny natin in this response. What we will deny will be premises 2 and 3. We will question the inevitability of if you're a sheep, then you'll be with God in heaven. Okay? Ito yung question natin, ha? Premises 2 and 3, not premise 1. So we'll deny uh, those two premises. How do we do that? We question inevitability. Now, here's a fatalist analog. Now, if you look at this uh, uh, argument, this one came from uh, Michael Dummett, uh, 20th century English philosopher from Oxford University. So, yeah, a fatalist will have this kind of thinking. Either you are going to be killed by a bomb or you are not going to be killed by a bomb. If you're going to be killed by a bomb, that then it is inevitable <laughs> that you were you're going to be killed by a bomb. If you're not, then it's inevitable that you're not going to be killed. So it is not, it is inevitable that you'll be, you are going to be killed or not by a bomb. I think um, a better way of thinking about this argument, kung fatalist ka, teka lang, seminarians pala kayo, I, I, I can't use the example of uh, Tadida. Uh, how uh, does love love then? You meant to be love. Diba? Yung ano, na, wag na gamitin yun dito. If you're bound to be the Pope, okay? If you are going to be, either you're going to be a Pope or not. Ayan, kasi seminarians kayo, so gawin natin pang seminarian yung, yung outcome. Either you'll be the head of the Catholic Church, or you'll not be the head of a, the, you're not going to be the head of the Catholic Church. If you're going to be the head of the Catholic Church, or if you're going to be the Pope, then whatever you do, kahit anong gawin mo, it's inevitable that you'll be. Alright? Kung hindi naman, if you're not going to be a Pope, then whatever you do, it's inevitable that you're not going to be a Pope. So either way, it's inevitable that either you're going to be a pope, or sorry, you're going to be a pope, or not going uh, a pope. So that's a, one way of generating this kind of fatalist attitude, this fatalist argument. And if you look at uh, that kind of fatalism vis-a-vis our puzzle, it looks like, yes, that's right. That's the fatalist attitude that we are in. When you think about being sheep and goat, and then you're thinking about it in terms of what's inevitable for you in the future, in the afterlife. Okay? 
Again, these are argument analogs, especially the tenses. Notice that now we're using present tense in both uh, instances. So no fancy footwork than the future tense uh, distinction with present tense or still using uh, present tenses here. So you, the fatalist attitude is generated using the same language, same tense. So they are perfect analogs, so to speak. Now, here's the thing about inevitability. Okay? So our sense of fatalism, as we have seen here, that events are inevitable, seems to stem from the idea that if Sam, something happened, then it must happen. That is, if I ate eggs this morning, then necessarily I ate eggs this morning. If I'm going to be the Pope, then necessarily I'm going to be the Pope. I have a sense of inevitability that we have in this kind of fatalist uh, argument that we're, we're playing around with. Now, the response, I am denying the inevitability here, would be something like, if something did happen, was it inevitably happen? Think about it. Okay? Kung may nangyari, or kung may nangyari, inevitable bang dapat mangyari siya? Think about that kind of uh, attitude. And you'll see that we could have this thing, uh, we could distinguish, uh, Thomas Aquinas, distinguo, uh, we can distinguish between two types of necessity at work here, or inevitability at work. So we could compare something like, necessarily, if P is the case, then P is the case. And if P is the case, then necessarily P is the case. Okay. When we think about the fatalist uh, premise, okay, the sense of necessity is in the second one. But the second one is false, plainly false. Because P might actually be true, but it is not necessary that it's true. Now compare this one with the first one. Okay, necessarily, if P is the case, then P is the case. Now one is just trivially true. You say this this thing here, if P is the case, then P is. Parang if I am uh, doing a lecture now, I'm doing a lecture now. That's trivial. That's a tautology. It's necessarily true. Yes, that's right. But hindi naman ibig sabihin na if I'm doing a lecture now, it's necessary that I'm doing a lecture now. I could have been somewhere else. Diba? Pwede namang di ako nagising. <laughs> diba? And so on and so forth. So the necessity here does not work for premise two. It works for, ah, sorry, for the, the second instance. It works for the first instance. So what's the lesson that we could learn here? Well... When we go back to the fatalist argument, you'll see that there's something wrong with premises two and three here. Deba? Kasi nga, if you're going to be killed by a bomb, then it is inevitable? Nope, it's not inevitable that you'll be killed by a bomb. Or you'll be a pope. And so on. Okay? So it's just false that if something did happen, it must inevitably happen. Now, could we use this kind of technique, this kind of argument, right, or this kind of reason to deny the premises in our puzzle? Okay. Well, if we do that, then even if you are essentially a sheep or a goat, it is not necessary that you are bound to be in heaven or hell. Okay. Now, sorry ah, kasi mga pilosopo, mahilig sa, oh, ito may sagot ka na, hindi, hindi pa tapos ang laban, meron pa akong babanat sa'yo. Ganyan yung mga philosophers eh. So, wala ka tapos ang, ano yan. So, let's try, uh, let's try to question uh, the response six. So, let's try to revive the notion of inevitability. Let's be fatalists. So, the theological underpinning of the puzzle implies that if you are a sheep, then you are bound to be in heaven. Otherwise, you are 
bound to be in hell. However, this boundedness is of a different from form from the inevitability from what we have discussed earlier. Iba yung bounded dun sa inevitable. Tuha ba? Pwedeng uh, inevitable, pero you're, uh, sorry, pwedeng bounded, but it's, it's not inevitable. Okay? Pwedeng inevitable, if it is inevitable, it's bounded, pero if it is bounded, it's not necessarily inevitable. So, to think about boundedness, it seems like you have the, the two premises here looks like hindi yung fatalist argument kanina, hindi ito yung itsura niya eh. Okay? Hindi yan yung form no ating premises 2 and 3. Rather, it is of this form. Some other thing will be the highest. So yes, that's right. This one is trivially true. Yes, we could deny yung inevitability idea here. But our two premises, right? If you are essentially a sheep, then you're bound to be with God in heaven. Does not look like this. Okay? Hindi siya ito. Ito siya. Okay? So it's something else. So we can't use that <laughs> technique right? to, uh, to, under, uh, to undermine the argument. Okay, so, so far, from responses six, uh, 2 to 6, all of them accepted the ar that the argument is valid. Ay, lahat sila accept the valid yan, unsound lang, but because they're denying one of the premises. But let's look at a response that denies the validity of the argument. Parang, ano, weird eh? How can you deny the validity of the argument? The structure is solid. Diba? Logic tells you that that argument is valid. And all you have to do is to deny one of the premises if you're a theist. Well, we could do this if we deny the exhaustiveness nature of Jung or. Because again, premise one assumes that you're either one or two, but not both. But why accept this? Can't you be both? Uh, this is my third time to present this paper. Hi. I'm, I'm, I'm finalizing it uh, for publication somewhere in the future. But I can't help but think about this particular response. This is my favorite response so far. I'm, I'm for this response. Why? Well, you could think about it in terms of a Venn diagram. So you have a sheep, you have a goat, okay? pero you could have this. You could be this. Right? You're essentially a sheep and you are essentially a goat. We are always thinking about goats and sheep in terms of a mutually exclusive set of categories that they are, you can't be both. But there is a possibility that you are a geek. Right? Now, when I was searching uh, the internet for uh, a picture, uh, it turns out that there is such a thing as a geep. I'm not sure if this is a hoax. You tell me. But yes, there's a geep. It's a thing which is both a sheep and a goat. So why think that they are mutually exclusive? No harm. So <laughs> what's, what's, the, what's the punchline? What's the punchline here? Oh, there's an analogy. So we can think about uh, sheep and goats. Because it's binary. Lang siya eh. But you can think about uh, that some things are both true and false. If you want an analogy using true and false, truths and falsity, sheep and goats, right and wrong, you can think of what they call gluts. Right now, there's a, an exciting field in logic known as glutty logic. Okay, so there's a gappy logic that we have discussed a while ago. You have the binary logic of true and falsity. And there's a glutty logic. Kaya gluts kasi matabak matabak siya. Okay, gluton siya. So it, it accepts truths and falsities. Okay? So this is a fat 
conception of truth. Okay, so we could have sentences which are both true and false. Uh, consider three such sentences. So you could have the lawyer sentence, as a uh, <laughs> really interesting example. Or you could have mundane um, sentences like a sentence about motion and a sentence about choice. So I'll, I'll show you uh, uh, these examples. So here's the liar sentence. So consider the sentence, this sentence is in red highlight is false. Question, is that sentence true? Now this is your classic, uh, yung I am lying to you right now. Nagsisinungaling ako ngayon sa inyo. Nagsabi ba ako ng totoo? Yan yung classic uh, liar paradox. So, ito lang naman yung sentence na yan. So, this sentence in red, in red highlight is false. Now, is it true? If you're thinking in terms of binaries of truths and falsities, uh, you'll have a problem because if it is true, then what it says holds. So since it says that it's false, if it is true, it's false. On the other hand, if it is false, then what it says does not hold. So since it says that it's false, so it's, it's false, then it's true. So the liar sentence here is both true and false. That's the argument. All right. Hello, can you hear me still? Are you still there? <clears throat> yes, sir. Can you still see me? Can you still hear me? All right. Yes. Did you hear the argument? So that's... It's a paradox. I like it. I like it. I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, Am sir. I flaky? Yes, po. Yes, po. Yes, po. Yes, yes, sir. All right, we can hear you now, Doc Yogi. All right. All right, so I was unstable. <laughs> All right, going back. So the argument for the, some sentences are both true and false. So the liar sentence is, a, is an example of that one. And there's another example about motion. If I say I am moving, I'll ask you, is it true? Well, if I'm moving, then I'm moving from one point to another. If I'm moving from one point to another, then I'm not in one particular point. I'm in a constant flux. Thus, I, if I'm moving, I am and I am not in a part, at a particular point. That's just the definition of motion. Right? It's a displacement from one place to another, one point to another. So if you're moving, you're not at in, you are at the same point at the same time. Right? So that's another uh, sentence that's true and false. Another one is a sentence about choice. So if you're, you're saying that I'm choosing between this or that, if you ask the question, is that true? Well, if you're choosing this or that, then you are yet to make a choice between those two things. So if you're yet to make a choice, then you are in a state you are, where you are both making and not making the choice. So when you are choosing, you are and you are weird those sentences, if you have you think about this, these are weird things. Glots are really weird things and they behave weirdly as well, logically speaking. So, so two philosophers uh, have tried to discern the logical behavior of this kind of glut. So one, one is my friend, Graham Priest. Uh, right now he's at um, the graduate, uh, sorry, CUNY, uh, Center City University of New York. He's doing, uh, he's still alive and well. Uh, the other guy is from... 
<laughs> Teka lang. Dr. Dacella just emailed me. Uh, just messaged me. Schrodinger. Yeah, in a way, yes. Schrodinger Scott. It's dead and not dead at the same time. It's a glut. Yun nga. Okay? Uh, so, to, to think about the logic of that, so this guy, Graham Priest, developed a logic. Uh, independently, it was also developed by the Brazilian, I think, si Asenho. Uh, their logic looks like this one. So, here's Graham. Good friend of mine. Learned a lot from him. So, ang tawag nila sa logic is the logic of paradox. So, we'll call it LP for our case. Or it's the glotty logic. So, like uh, the L3 Rukasevich's logic, it, it's a three-valued logic. So, you have true, false, and the glut. So, instead of thinking about gaps, you think about gluts. Right? One thing about the glutty logic is that it denies the law of non-contradiction. Diba sabi ko kanina, may law of excluded middle, tapos may law of non-contradiction. So the law of non-contradiction uh, looks like this in logical form. So it's not the case that P is, P is true and not P is true. Okay? And so the logic, if you accept gluts, uh, you need to dispense of this because some things will be both true and false. Both the case and not the case. Also, one, one curious thing about the logic is that it's not an explosive logic. So the, the ex explosive nature of logic is your logic ex is explosive if you accept that from a contradiction, anything follows. So the logic that you have learned in school, your elementary logic, Symbolic logic, even I think um, a bit of the traditional Aristotelian logic, if you look, look at what's going on there, it's also an ex explosive logic. Because from a contradiction, if you have uh, a proposition in its contradictory uh, thing, you could generate any other proposition. Okay? Now, if you look, uh, if you use this kind of thinking uh, of gluts, okay, then we could have a way to respond to the argument. Okay. Here's one way. So instead of denying any of the premises here, okay, hindi mo din deny yung premises. Okay, ina accept mo yung premises, but the conclusion won't follow. Why? Because you have a case wherein all of these things will be either true or both true or false, or uh, and false, right? But you could have a false conclusion for it. Okay? I won't get into the technical details of the logic itself, but uh, I'll just assure you that if you have this kind of logic, you could show that the argument is invalid. So you have a case wherein this one will be both true and false. You are essentially a sheep and you're essentially a goat. Okay, because you could have that glut in your thinking. This one will be both true and false as well. Okay? This part here. So this makes this thing uh, both true and false. But again, you have reasons to deny the, the conclusion, even if you grant that the argument is valid in this logic. Okay. Now, some problems about the LP solution. Now, of treating... Uh, people like us as both sheep and goats. Uh, first is rationality. Is it even rational to believe in gluts? So uh, a recent work that I've, 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 I've done uh, uh, thinks about this. Reasonable ba na maniwala sa gluts? That there are sentences which are true and false? Or uh, another way is that this means that we have a sheep and a goat nature, so we are essentially a geep. Right? So, yun yung mga pwede yung mga about this. Uh, here are some tentative rejoinders against those uh, things. Uh, the question, yes, is it even rational to believe in gluts? Yep. Via an inference to the best explanation. So, there's an argument that if you take in sentences like the sentence from motion, sentence about choice as both true and false, 
then you need the logic to to handle those things. So yeah, it's reasonable to be even guts. Uh, does this mean that we have a sheep and a goat nature? Yes, we have a good side and a bad side. That's just being human. But are we essentially geeks? Nope. Because it's possible that we have an entire, sh entirely sheep nature and, or an entirely uh, goat nature, so to speak. Okay. So I think we have uh, gone through a lot of things already. Okay. So some conclusions. Can you still hear me? Yes, Doc J. All right. So yeah, last yes. last last part. Uh, so I'm ra wrapping up now. Huh? So, um, so what I presented you here are is the puzzle of sheep and goats. So this is just an exploration of how we could use the tools of analytic philosophy to think about theological doctrines, theological things, right? how to use the, the available resources of logic, metaphysics, right? think about whether we are sheep or we are goats. Now, I also outlined seven possible responses to the puzzle. I am for the, the last uh, option, but I'm still weighing my options here because I think uh, you can still make possible uh, criticisms. So I'm still working on that. So if we could have a good discussion later about this one, it would be helpful. But I think uh, the main thing that I want to in, um, instill, okay, so lahat ng nandito ngayon, is that, um, of course, if you are a theologian, if you are a seminarian, you're going for um, <laughs> the priesthood or whatnot, I you need to have at least this kind of attitude of faith-seeking understanding. And you can use the tools of analytic philosophy to help you out in your theological endeavors. Salama, thank you very much. That ends my presentation. Thank you so much, Doc JJ Joaquin, uh, for such an interesting and filling, uh, knowledge filling discourse. Our logic, our logic notes in our heads are being refreshed. And in just uh, quite a brief manner, not usually a lengthy one, you were able to share in full the topic we have at hand. So theriology being looked at in the lens of logic, even past the metaphysical talks, and other sorts of philosophical concerns, and almost never-ending argumentations, expounding and bridging out all of the underlying questions and concerns from this seemingly quite simple argumentation or the puzzle of sheep and goats, so to speak. Because of our view of salvation and our faith in God and even our own selves as followers of Christ are being talked about here. All right, at this, at this juncture, we should now move on to the panel discussion and joining Dr. Joaquin are some lucky representatives of each class, starting with Mark Vincent Thomas of the class of St. Mary the Archangel, Kirk Gabriel Gatapia from the class of St. Teresa of Calcutta, uh, Josh Ireland Ethan Chavez of the class of St. Paul the Apostle, and Mark Caesar Adarlo of the class of St. Luke the Evang Evangelist. Okay, I guess we should start okay. with uh, Ryan. Uh, good morning, uh, Sir, Sir Jay. Thank you for very informative talk nyo, presentation. Uh, I don't know if itong nanda kong question po is may, medyo babagsak siya sa theology or philosophy po. Eh. Pero siguro yung, I, have, uh, I prepared two questions po. So first question ko, um, why does um, eschatology matter today, no? uh, especially po now na this time of pandemic? At the same time, these dry times po na sunod-sunod yung mga kalamidad, yung mga uh, typhoon na nararanasan natin. So why does eschatology matter today? Then second question po, uh, after hearing your talk, no, uh, present nyo rin yung sa verse sa uh, Matthew. Naalala ko yung verse sa uh, Jeremiah. 
Uh, yung ano po yung before I form you in the womb, I know you. Before you were born, I set you apart and so on and so on forth po. At the same time, yung hindi ko lang malala kung ano talagang verse yun, pero yung may nasinulat na, he determined no, the time set for them. So parang ang question ko po, uh, is it possible sir ba na we are also being uh, parang ano ba, uh, determined po no, uh, like the sheep and the goat because uh, we believe naman yung sinabi yung uh, God is omniscient. So because he already knows no, uh, how and where we could live po. So ano po ba to? It is more of uh, parang determinism ba rather than fatalism or mas fatalism po? So yun po yung question ko, sir. Hi. So that that's uh, <laughs> lovely, lovely uh, question. Smart, smart pa, pa talaga. Alam daw Paul Ben. Okay. So I, I like the question. I'm really interested. This is a second one now before the first one. So this one is really a fatalist argument. It's not a determinist argument. So determinism is just to distinguish the two things here. So determinism is the thesis that given the laws of nature. Given the history of the universe, uh, we could predict in in a way what will happen in the future. Okay, or uh, there's a cause in everything that we do. So that's how they are thinking about determinism. So the thesis that we are we are playing around with it's not of that sort. So it's not a contingent premise. It's not a contingent proposition. We're thinking about if necessarily you are a goat, then you'll be in. It's inevitable that you'll be in, um, uh, what, what's this, uh, in hell. So your fatalist argument is more of an a priori or logical premise. Okay? It's true. Uh, if it is true, it's necessarily true. So determinism is more of, a, if it is true, it's contingently true. It's a fact about the world. That the world is either determined or it's not determined. So that's the, the answer there. So the, the, the argument that we were playing around with is more fatalistic rather than deterministic. The first question is about yung ano bang kwenta ng mga pinag-usapan natin dito sa, sa eschatological fatalism. If, you know, um, given the pandemic, I think talagang mapapaisip ka ngayon. Diba? Na if God permits this kind of thing, Diba? There's a, siguro, ganun talaga eh. Diba? May tinadhana eh. Ganun, ganun yung pag-iisip ng fatalist eh. But I think the challenge will be, do we want to be fatalists? Diba? That's why we were questioning the whole, the, the whole endeavor here of um, this kind of fatalistic action. I'm not a fatalist, by the way. Although I believe that may tadhana, may sufficient reason sa mga bagay-bagay. But I don't believe na there's, uh, we're fated to be whatever. We still have a certain handle of what's going on with our lives, right? So yun, so yung pag ano dun sa mga, kunyari, yung mga ibang attitude kasi ng mga tao ngayon, kunyari, yung, diba? Kung, ano, ano yung narinig kong argument dati? Yung nagsisimula pa lang yung, yung pandemic, ang isang argument na narinig ko. Eh kung magka-COVID naman ako, magka-COVID ako eh. So lalabas na lang ako. Kung hindi naman ako magka-COVID, di ba? Yun yung ganang lasing attitude eh. Pero I don't think that that works. Yung ganang lasing argumentation. Kaya ka nga nagiging safe eh. Kaya ka nga nasa bahay lang. Kasi ayaw yung ma-COVID. <laughs> so, hindi inevitable na magka-COVID ka or hindi. Okay? It's up to you. It's still up to you if you want to be safe or not safe. Going back to Jeremiah, I like the... I think it's in the... Ano yun? Yung before I... Uh, I, whatever, I already know you. Yung ano na yan. Uh, classic, parang fatalist uh, argument din yan. But I, I don't think that we could attribute fatalism to that idea. It's more of omniscience, perhaps. So that's a different uh, idea of, I know it. God is omniscient because he knows everything. And that, that gives you a different puzzle altogether. There's an interesting uh, work on the... Problems of omniscience. Iba pang classing ano to? Iba pang classing philosophy. But if you're interested, uh, if I could share my slide. Uh, 
Pwede ko ba bang i-share yung slide ko? If you're still interested here, because I have a series of lectures on um, philosophy of religion. I'm writing a book on philosophy of religion. So one argument that I'm playing around with is the uh, argument against omniscience. So some of... Um, ito, kinote ko nga yung Jeremiah. <laughs> Kaya nga natuwa ako na kinote mo siya. Because I'm also, I also quoted uh, Jeremiah here in this passage. Uh, so, yeah, that, there, there's an interesting uh, epistemic problem. So, Dr. DeSella knows this one, yung get your problem. So, can you generate a kind of get your problem case dun sa omniscience to God? And yes, there could be within the vicinity of uh, omniscience literature, pwede. Uh, ka mag generate. So, uh, one guy who's doing a lot of work there is Patrick Grimm. So, he has a uh, work, The Problems of Omniscience. So, if you're interested there, uh, pwede mong tingnan yun. But it's more omniscience rather than uh, fatalism per se. Hi, right. I think. Thank you. Thanks very much for the question. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Next is, uh, may I call on Mr. Gatapia? His question or words, some words? Uh, good morning po. Uh, I will, uh, nag-iisip lang po. Uh, Posible po kaya na ano, i-accept natin yung mga, yung mga arguments. Then, di ba po pag in-accept natin yun, we will deny God's omniscience, omnipotence, and everything. Possibly po kaya na, ano, na i-accept natin yun, then, uh, ano, then we accept also yung ano, denial of God's ano, omniscience, mga omni-omni po. Then, via negative, uh, ano, we will say that he's not uh, omniscient because he is more than omniscient. I don't know. Kasi may medieval philosopher po na nagsabi na yun. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I, I like I like the attempt here, Kirk. I think you're on to something, but let me just uh, just clarify some things about the via negativa thing. So, the medieval technique of arguing for a positive thesis via negativa about God. Ang ibig sabihin nun, uh, hindi that God is not omniscient. Rather, it's the idea that God is not limited in knowledge. Kasi ang, ang style dun sa via negativa, uh, let's have some properties that we attribute, for example, to ourselves or to any finite being, tapos our created being, tapos we deny those things and arrive at some attributes dun sa God. So that's a kind of theological technique or philosophical technique. Uh, one guy who did that is the Jewish philosopher, actually. Maimonides. It's okay, a guide to the per perplexed. So he was thinking about God, but you can't really fathom the enormity of God. So he's not us. He's not finite. He's not limited. He's not changing, and so on and so forth. Yun yung via negativa. Now, I'm not sure if you could use that here in this puzzle. Da, sige, let's deny na lang that God is omniscient, or let's deny na lang that God is omnipotent. So, sasabihin mo yun. Pero if you deny that God is omnipotent, you deny God is omniscient, or you deny God is omnibenevolent, then you don't have a God. Because God is omnipotent. God is omnibenevolent. God is omniscient. So yung argument niya, if you extend this argument, if, if you like, now to extend it as an argument against the existence of God, you can do it. Hi. Hi, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gatapia. Uh, 
Let us now move on to Mr. Uh, Thomas. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, brothers. Uh, uh, one, one of the questions that popped up in my mind during this uh, uh, symposium is that uh, kung pwede pong maging showed uh, as a sheep or a sheep and also a goat, uh, paano po nangyayari yun? Then, is there an assurance if ever uh, that a person is showed according to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, argument or to the puzzle? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, I'll take your question as, suppose that we are sh geeps or shots, as Dr. Dasela is also saying. Yung nga yung isa pang tabag. Hindi gleep pare, geep. Okay. Okay, so, suppose that that's the case. So, suppose that uh, you are a goat or a geep. In the, uh, sorry, if you are a shot or a sheep. Ang tanong mo, is paano nangyayari yun? What's going on there in this in this kind of picture? So what does it? How does it relate to the puzzle? Uh, it relates to the puzzle in the following way. So you are not. There's a third possibility. So you're not just a sheep. There's a sheep. There's a goat. Pero hindi sila mutually exclusive. Because there's a third possibility that you're both a sheep and a goat. Now what I'm thinking is, so if you're a, a geep or a shoat. Perhaps you're not bound to be in heaven or you're bound to be in hell. So, yung premises mo will be invalid, leading to the conclusion. You can't arrive at dun sa conclusion. Kasi, um, geep ka nga eh. So, you're neither a geep, ah, sorry, a sheep nor a goat. Ngayon, how does it work? Now, ito yung masakit sa ulo ng pag isipan Kunyari sa end of days, geep ka lang talaga. So we're just still granting the premise that if you are a sheep, you'll be in heaven. If you're a goat, you'll be in hell. But it it ended up na you are a geep all throughout. Di ka na nagbago. Sabi natin na di ka na naging mabait, di ka naging masyadong masama. So ano ka lang, steady lang. Ang tanong, saan ka pupunta? That's the, 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 the topic of the other paper that I was working on. So how do you think about hell? That was heaven. If there's a third possibility, in your purgatory idea, perhaps geeps will go to purgatory, not to heaven or hell. Now, I know your doc. I, I don't know if you know the doctrine of purgatory, but the doctrine of purgatory, parang safe, nasa safe zone gane, eh. nasa lapik na sa heaven. Eh. Pero ang problema lang don, kailangan pa ng konting ano yun? Dasal, de ba? Kailangan pagdasalan ka para mahatawid ka sa langit. Eh. Wala ka nang pwedeng gawin pag nasa purgatory ka. Pero yung mga taong naiwan mo, sila yung pwede magdasal. Or yung mga nasa heaven pala, yung pwede magdasal para sa'yo. Parang ganun yata yung doctrine. That, that's an interesting prospect. Pero again, it generates another sort of puzzle. Diba? So, how do you distinguish someone from heaven and someone from purgatory or someone from hell if yung konti lang yung difference sila eh? Post! That God's criteria criterion for accepting you to heaven is C. Yun yung criterion. Papupunta ka sa langit kung meron kang C. Question. Kunyari, si Kirk. Hi, Kirk. Nansyon ka ba? Hello po. Hello? Can you see? Yeah. Uh, sabihin na, si Kirk, ano siya, meron siyang C, pero almost niya lang nakuha. Barely nakuha niya lang yung C. Tapos, suppose si Thomas, Almost but not quite, nakuha niya yung C. Okay? So si Kirk, dahil sa ano, pasang awa, napunta sa langit, si Thomas napunta sa hell or sa purgatory. Kasi konti lang eh. Muntik na Thomas, kaso hindi ka napunta sa langit. Yun yung, ano, yun yung pwedeng question na naman. Na, so, if that's the case, it, would God be just? Diba? So you could question God's justice and so on. Uh, so that's a different puzzle altogether. But to, the, the answer to your just 
to, to your question about geeps, yeah, we, we are geeps. We could be um, go sheeps or we could be goats, uh, sorry, sheep. We could be goats at the end of days, right? But if you remain a geep all throughout your life, then so be it. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Tom Thomas. And instead of having Mr. Chavez, let us hear from Mr. Aaron Joshua Calderon from the third year class. Uh, good morning, po, yeah. sir. Good morning, brothers. So, uh, my question is, uh, going back po to the first premise, uh, I would want to clarify it, po, Father. Ah, sir, uh, can you define again po the, the difference between uh, the essentiality or and the necessit necessity? The and all father. Is... <laughs> I was, sorry, po, sir. Uh, what does it imply po when one says one is essentially a sheep or one is necessarily a sheep? Yun po. Pang -clar merely clarification lang po. Dr. J? Tirawa ko. <laughs> Sorry. Nilamo na ako ng hell eh. Sorry. I'm back. <laughs> okay. Uh, were you able to grasp the question for of ano, uh, Mr. Calderon, Doc J? Actually, nawala ako. Nilamon nga ako ng ano eh. Ako nagagalit na sa akin ng kung sino man eh. <laughs> okay po, sige po. Uh, uh, the question po is... Um, Going back po to the first premise, uh, I would want to clarify po, uh, sir, can you define po what is the difference between uh, the essentiality and necessity? Po? And what does it imply when one says one is essentially a ship or when one is necessarily a ship? Po? Actually, that's an interesting question. And right now, Father Max and I are in a debate. And you know, Father Maxel. Father Max, are you here? Wala, di do mating si. Kilala niyo naman si Father Maxel, de ba? So we are thinking about necessities and essential natures. Eh. The question, I, I like the question very much, and I'm, I'm uh, thank you, Aaron, because I am right now I'm grappling with how do you distinguish between necessities and essentialities. Here's one one stab at the problem. Necessities, uh, you can think about necessities in terms of you have a well, better way of putting it for you. Think about sentences, okay? When do we say that a sentence is necessarily true? One way of cashing that out is in terms of possible worlds. Okay? So, ito, move the logic ng konti. So, when we say that something is necessarily true, it means that that sentence is true in all possible worlds. So what's an example of a necessary, necessarily true sentence? Well, perhaps mathematical sentences will be necessarily true because it's true in all possible worlds. Now, how do you think about essential things? Obviously, it's not essential for you to be a human being. Right? Oh, sorry, it's not necessary for you to be a human being. Because you could have been an alligator for all we know. Uha? Yung pagiging alligator, pwedeng it's a possibility for you. But because you are a human being, it's, you have some essential features of being a human being. Uha ba? So you might, parang, parang here, here's, the, here's the take. The take is, you could have a different set of properties but once you have them, you have them essentially. Right, so you can distinguish between necessities and essentialities in terms of that. Now, one guy who's doing a lot of work uh, regarding this, if you're interested, but in uh, heavy duty metaphysics or heavy duty, uh, yeah, heavy duty metaphysics, I'll just show you this guy. He's a, a friendly friend. Then, kami ng konde, all the snob to eh. 
So here's one guy who's doing really excellent work, Sikit Fine. So he's, he has a work, Essence and Modality, wherein he distinguishes between necessities on the one hand and essences on the other hand. Okay? So kung sinabi ko sa'yo, you are essentially a sheep or essentially a star. Gawin na lang natin human being. You are essentially a human being. Well, it's not necessary that you are a human being. You could have been some, some other thing. Okay? Wag naman sana. If reincarnation is true, then you might have been something else. Or you might be something else in the future. Pero sana hindi to yun. Pero it could have been the case. Pero, yeah, that's necessity. Pero essentiality is a different breed altogether. Parang it's a property that you have without which you're not the same thing. Tuha? Tuha ba? Without that property, you are not that thing. Kunyari, si Aaron Joshua Calderon, kung hindi siya tao, hindi siya si Aaron Joshua Calderon. Okay? So that's a, a, the, the property which is essential to you. Pero does it mean that your existence is a necessary existence. That being a human being is a necessary, uh, necessary thing for you. No. Because you could have been some other thing. Or, pwede naman hindi ka nag-exist. Eh. So, those are possibilities. Okay, so, it's not true that Aaron Calderon is necessarily a human being. Pero, since you are a human being, you are essentially a human being because you have some natures which are essential to you. I like the question because it's making me think. Right now, I'm doing another work. Uh, share ko na rin. Ito yung pinagtatalunan namin ni Father Maxel uh, the other day. Because I'm writing so, a piece on this one. So I have a friend, si J.C. Beal. And he just published this paper uh, sa Religious Studies Journal just last month. Tapos he offered a way to think about yung Christology, yung divine nature ni Christ, ah, sorry, the two natures of Christ. He's fully divine and fully human. Tapos he's offering a way of thinking about that in terms of modalities, okay, necessary properties across possible worlds. I'm thinking that there's something wrong with this paper. I'm writing a piece on this one, so if you could help out, that would be great. But uh, yeah, there's a, uh, uh, what I'm saying is that there's a distinction between a nece necessary property and an, an essential property. And Christ might be, Jesus Christ might be essentially human and divine, but it's not necessary that he's human and divine. You can't attribute yung necessity and possibilities as uh, attributes of God. Oh, sorry, of Christ. So, the Christology na pinapropose ko is more of a Christology of essences rather than uh, necessities or possibilities. So, it's a direct uh, reply to this uh, interesting article, actually. Okay. Thanks. I like that, Daryl. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Calderon, and thank you, beloved brothers. At this point, the, plat the platform is now open for other questions, clarifications, and comments in response to the today's topic. Kindly make yourself recognized if you have one, or you may use the chat feature, and either I or one of the representatives of IFC will read your words. Uh, let me begin po with a question coming from Dr. Dasela. Uh, he asked that, isn't the GLEEP solution in Consistent with God's omniscience. I don't know if this is a legit one, Dr. Desela. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it's still consistent because God may knows that you are a geep. So, hindi niya na ano yun, hindi niya na nasisira yung omniscience in that, in that case. Pero, does it generate yung fatalist uh, conclusion? Nope, it's not generated. Does it go against omniscience? Nope, it does not. At least as we look at it. Because dito papasok yung free will defense or whatever. So you could have that uh, well, card if you are going for that. Did he just question the legitimacy of my... Yes, he did. <laughs> no, 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 no.
Okay, uh, any other questions? Please, Dr. Desela. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, I guess uh, Mr. Hoson, Mr. Biel Hoson has a question. Uh, good morning po, Sir, ano, Sir Joaquin. Uh, I really like the symposium today. Uh, it's really thought-provoking and uh, mind-boggling. So, uh, siguro po gusto ko lang po sana bumalik tayo dun sa, ano nyo po, sa slide nyo po ng gospel reading nyo po, kung anong translation po ginamit nyo. Parang gusto ko lang po siguro maano, uh, maklarify po dun sa translation na ginamit nyo. Okay, uh, sige. We have a Bible expert here. No, hindi naman po. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Actually, yeah. you know, wordy din ako dito sa mga uh, nito. The translation. Uh, can you see my slide? Apa. So I'm using your uh, new version. I think it's the uh, NSV New Standard Version of the Bible. Okay. Meron naman tong Nihil Obstat sa may imprimatur to. So I think <laughs> I think it's uh, it's um, accepted by the Catholic Church. So na yeah, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, it's it's using the new standard version NSV. Nito say King James version. It's not a Protestant version. I'm mean, using the Catholic version. NSRV. That's right. NSRV. So napansin ko lang po do sa ano, verse 32. Uh, Before yeah. him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So, uh, what I'm ano, currently thinking po, uh, regarding this verse is, siguro we should not re literally take na uh, we are fated to be, uh, we are fated or determined na tayo ay sheep or uh, goats. But, uh, ang point lang po siguro ng gospel na to is that uh, we will be, ano, we will be uh, divided or we will be. Uh, uh, gathered or separated, but not necessarily that we are not, uh, we are sheep or goats. Kaya parang... Yeah, I like that. Actually, yan din yung isang comment sa akin when I presented this one somewhere. Okay, kasi uh, ito yung pinagbasihan niya. Sabi niya, tingnan mo yung, ano, yung next part ng gospel. Ah, gospel to. Gospel to bukas nga pala. So, <laughs> ang sabi niya, tika lang, tingnan mo yung ano, for I, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat and so on and so forth. So, parang action siya eh. So, it's a good work na nag-generate, kaya ka naging sheep or kaya ka naging goat. Hindi kasi. Pero here's the problem with that interpretation. If you're thinking about, ah, si God dumating, tapos he will just separate the things, the good people from the bad people. And the good people will be in the good place, tapos the bad people will be in the bad place. My problem is, why did he use yung metaphor ng sheep and goats? Na parang substantial yung distinction eh. So if you're a sheep, hindi ka naman pwede maging goat eh. <laughs> or kung goat ka, uh, hindi ka naman pwede maging sheep. Now, there's a, a long history long exegetical interpretation kung bakit sheep sa goats yung ginagamit sa Bible. But I'm not really interested in the biblical interpretation or biblical, ano. I'm more concerned about, okay, let's suppose that this is the interpretation, that you have a strong idea of what a sheep is and a goat is. Tapos, since if you're a goat, you can't be a sheep, <laughs> di ba? If you're a sheep, you can't be a goat. So if that's the highest thing, what will happen? Yeah, yun yung, yun yung motivation why I thought about the puzzle. Now it seems like the, the par parable implies a kind of faithless. You might reject that interpretation. Well and good. 
Ay, tama, tama naman. Kasi nga, sabihin mo, uh, it's not consistent with some other gospel version. I think John has a different formulation of this one. Diba? From Matthew. But again, I, I, I'm open if you go for that kind of exegesis. But the point of the presentation is not exegesis. It's more of, let's think about the, the philosophy underlying the, the, the parable. Tapos, how does it relate to some doctrines like uh, soteriology, salvation? How is it related to eschatology and so on? But I like that. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mr. Hosan. Any other questions? Good morning, Doctor. Uh, I just want to... Uh, can you hear me? Kuya Lawrence, tinig naman? Yes, yes, Joshua. Okay. Please proceed. I just want to ask for some, seek for some clarification. Uh, I don't know if Aristotelian logic still applies to this because it is he who, we know that it is he who proposed the non-contradiction principle. And first of all, thank you for introducing to many of us uh, this contemporary logic because we are used to Aristotelian logic. This is what, that is what we practice here. Uh, this is something new and uh, very complicated for, for me, it is very complicated analytic logic. But the question is, what role does the principle of non-contradiction play in uh, this, this um, uh, synthesis between go, goat and sheep or gloat or shoot, or gleep or gip or shoot? Or does it have something to do with uh, uh, the gip? Thanks, Joshua. Thanks for inviting me, by the way. Uh, sabi ni Dr. Dasela, sa kanya niyo raw ako nakuha eh. Um, uh, totoo ba yun muna? Kung totoo. Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Yes, Kung but... totoo, yeah, thank you, Mark Dasela, for advertising me to this bunch. <laughs> okay, that's good. We're promoting our brand of uh, doing philosophy. All right, so going back. So the, principle, uh, the law of non-contradiction is an integral uh, idea in Aristotle's whole logic, actually whole philosophy, right? Just to get it out there. So integral yun. So in principle of non-contradiction, I think is a, an axiom for it's a self-evident truth in Aristotle's system. Now, what's the problem with the non-contradiction? As I've said, uh, if the non-contradiction, the principle of non or the law of non-contradiction is right, then what do we say about the liar paradox, about sentences about motion, sentences about change, and sentences about choice? Anong gagawin mo dun? Kasi it seems like you have reasons to say, to reject the law of non-contradiction, as I have uh, shown it a while ago. Now, how, how does it relate? How does the non-contradiction relate to the parable and the puzzle that I gave? Well, I've motivated the puzzle in terms of the first premise that either you are essentially a goat or essentially a sheep, but not both. Yung, yung qualification ng not both hindi ka pwedeng maging both kasi if you are both, there's a contradiction. That's why you need to uh, have the principle of non-contradiction there to generate the puzzle. Now, how does my solution, yung kaninang logical paradox solution, address this kind of uh, puzzle? Well, if you're going for the logical paradox that I've shown, you need to deny the principle or the law of non-contradiction that means the argument is valid, but the conclusion is, uh, sorry, the, arg the premises are true, the conclusion is false. So the argument is invalid. That's it. Uh, yun yung work na ginagawa sa akin, at least uh, here in the solution, nung, nung glut. Okay? Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, doctor. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, uh, so yun, uh, yeah, uh, there's another guy. 
puro ano, citation, no? Pero ganoon talaga sa filo, eh. Ah, napakita ko na nga pala siya, no? So, if you're interested, there's another guy. I'll just show his face again. So, this guy, si Graham Priest nga. Uh, meron siyang sinulat. Uh, what's his book? So that's the uh, <laughs> that's the book Doubt Truth to Be a Liar. So John, uh, I think the first chapter questions Aristotle's uh, principle of non-contradiction. So pinakita niya na uh, actually kahit si Aristotle does not hold the principle of non-contradiction. Eh. Okay? Yun yung claim. Kasi yung, uh, I'm not sure if his uh, if his history of logic is right. But according to him, Aristotle's syllogistic logic, the original one, ah, not the thing that you are studying here in the seminary. Because he said, "Diba, meron A E I O, diba? Universal affirmative, etc., etc." Pero kay Aristotle tatlo lang kasi ang meron eh. Okay? Universal affirmative, the original Aristotle. Ah, if you look at the uh, posterior analytics, uh, and I thought. Aristotle's logic talaga, hindi Aristotelian logic, hindi tradition. So you have universal affirmative, universal negative, tapos particular positive. Tapos you define yung O in terms of E tsaka I. That's why you have yung, yung, yung syllogism na ferio, di ba? So yung ferio, yung E-I-O syllogism, ano yun? Dinidefine mo yung O in terms of E tsaka I. Pero hindi define yung O as part of Aristotle's thing. Now, going back to Aristotle. So, yung kay Aristotle kasi, if you have a, uh, uh, sorry, an E proposition and an I proposition, di ba dun sa square of, ano niya, square of opposition. So, A, E, A, E, I, O. Taga lang. Huwag na nga. <laughs> Dito na. Uh, square of para makita nyo, kung di nyo ma-visualize sa utak nyo. Yan! Okay. Ang dami natin ano. So, look at this one. So, ang sabi niya, Aristotle, if I have an E proposition and I proposition, I have a contradictory proposition. Tama. Tama. Pero sabi niya, you can't generate any conclusion so no valid syllogism could be attained from E, I. Especially kung it's about the same thing. Kung yan, pag sinabi mo, no A is B, no, uh, some A is B. Okay? Kay Aristotle, contradictory yun, pero no conclusion kang pwede create. Now, that's an interesting result because if that's the case, then Aristotle's logic is not an explosive logic as uh, Graham would say, Graham Peace would say. So, ibig sabihin, baka um, Aristotle himself does not abide by the principle of non-contradiction. That's interesting. It's an interesting take. So, I don't know if, you're, if you want to get into that. Ang, ang pinaka-argument lang ni Priest, it's a metaphysical thesis, but it's not a logical principle. Okay? It's a metaphysics that you could deny because you could have a different metaphysics altogether. But it's not a logical principle. It's not a principle of reasoning. That's interesting. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ocon. Um, I would like to read this question po from an anonymous brother. Ayon yung magpakalala. If being a goat or a sheep is your fate, then isn't it unfair for those who were destined to be a goat? Like, are they considered as victim of destiny for making them goat and not a sheep instead? Yun nga yung kanina yung pinag-usapan natin about omnibenevolence, di ba? If you have a God who's really all-loving, bakit naman yan? Hassle naman yun, di ba? Na may sheep tsaka goat. Yun nga yung hassle dun sa parable, eh. Why would God dis- ano, separate a sheep from a goat? If he truly loves us, then hata yung actually yun nga yung I don't know if uh, if this is a right interpretation of Luther, no? 
Pero yun nga yung sinasabi ng Protestant ethics. Eh. Ang sinasabi nila, hindi, lahat na nga tayo destined to be saved. Eh. Yung predestination idea. Eh. It's a fatalist idea as well. Kaya nga siya bumibenta <laughs> na idea na lahat tayo saved. Lahat tayo makapupunta sa langit. Don't worry. Be happy. Diba? Yun yung pero on the other hand, I'm not sure if you want to go that way as well. Because it seems like so. Kung nga, if you're fated to be in heaven or fated to be or oh, whatever, if you're if you're fated to be whatever, it seems like kahit wala ang gawin ni, de ba? Kung fate mo nga na maging pope, then kahit bulakbol ka na seminarista kahit sira ulo kang pare, magiging pope ka pa rin. Pero tama ba yung ganyang klase yung pag-iisip? Thank you. Okay. Uh, here's another one po. From an anonymous brother also. <laughs> While I was listening to the talk regarding fatalism, St. Augustine's predestination also came up in my mind. My question is, it could be possible that Augustine's predestination be a response to the puzzle? Yes, it is. Actually, yun nga yung ano, you just accept your fate. Uh, just to clarify, ha? so uh, Augustine, uh, as far as I know, has a more epistemic take dun sa predestination. It's not really a metaphysical take na you are fated to be. Rather, yes, you are fated to be, but you don't know. Diba? Yun yung twist kay uh, yung Augustine, eh, yung kanyang dialogue with his son. Uh, it's in the Freedom of the Will yet, uh, work. So what's going on there? It's also an Occam solution if you're familiar with William of Occam. Ang gagawin kasi nila, okay, so meron talagang hindi open yung future. Uh, it's still contingently true or false that, you, that some uh, proposition or some fact will obtain or some proposition will be true. However, we just don't know. Yan yung, ano, yan yung twist. So it's an epistemic twist. Uh, so parang, you're fated to be with God in heaven. Actually, lahat tayo eh. For, for Augustine naman, lahat naman tayo, di ba? Are good. Pero may levels lang, or grades lang ng good. So kaya ka nga mag-generate ng evil eh. Pero lahat tayo masasave. Yan yung idea ng ano, eh. Yung Augustine solution. But, since, ano, lumalayo ka lang dun sa divine type, so, supposedly. So, yeah, yeah, you could go for that solution. Uh, pero, um, balik ko naman, uh, gusto mo bang sumugal? So, hindi ka nagagawa ng tama? Or, bahala na sa buhay mo? Bahala ka na lang? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you po. Um... Are there any other uh, are there any questions for or words? Landris? Going once. <laughs> All right. Uh I guess there's no more, uh, there are no more questions for Doc J. And thank you so much, brothers, for your active participation in this, in, in this discourse. And Doc JJ, please take some words of gratitude from us to be given by Mr. Kenji Aragon, our Vice Community Beadle. Uh, good morning, po. Uh, on behalf of the Philosophy Department, uh, with our Director, Father Christopher Abal, and our Dean of Studies, Father Sid Marinay, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jeremiah. Sorry, first and foremost, for making your presence available for this symposium. <laughs> um, this symposium of ours won't be feasible without such passionate speaker like you. Po. Uh, also, thank you for imparting your knowledge about the given topic by providing both affirmation and neg uh, negation lenses to answer the puzzle of the sheep and goat and the estological fatalism. Uh, truly, we are blessed to have you po, as our speaker for this morning, giving such substantial and informative talk. Uh, once again, thank you, po, Dr. Jeremiah. Thank you. Salamat uh, din. Salamat. Once again, we thank you so much, Dr. JJ.
let us once again give him a virtual yet warm round of applause. I hope you learned something. We do, Doc J. Interesante po talaga yung topic for us now here. And bago rin po sa amin itong discourse na ito, kung totoo sa inyo po. Oo. I challenge you lang. Nandiyan ba si Father Max? Wala pa. Hindi. I challenge you lang if you're interested in this kind of heavy duty theology ito eh. Okay? Share ko na lang last. Para lang makita niyo yung developments. So sabi ko nga kanina, merong school of thought na lumalabas. And I hope that some of you will join this one. It's known as analytic theology. It's a big thing that's happening. So ito, kung interesado kayo. And I think there are some scholarships offered at St. Andrews, the Logos Institute for Analytic Theology. So kung makapasok kayo dyan sa ganitong klase ng discourse, that would be terrific. So I have some friends working on this kind of logic. Oh, sorry this kind of thing. So if you're interested, please do join this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jeremiah Jovlin Joaquin. Um, stay safe for always. And we hope to see you here in San Carlos po soon. <laughs> All right. Uh, at this juncture, we now move on to the next part of the program, which is the uh, sharing of Mr. Kalidayan's uh, philosophy entry essay. Now, but before that, we will uh, we will now go for a five-minute break in order for Mr. Devin to prepare his uh, presentation. Be back at 11, uh, 11, 11. <laughs> 